Welcome to Instigating Women, a podcast that um, my friend Gwen Sandifer and I decided to start. My name is Liz McLean Williams. We are both professional coaches and we are also um, women who believe that we need to empower uh, one another and we need to have more female voices in the workplace. And so we're going to be sharing examples of what coaching is and does. Um, and we're also gonna be telling stories about women um, making good trouble in the workplace. <laughs> um, welcome Gwen, tell us about you. Thank you. Um, as Liz said, I am with her in this coaching journey. I am originally from a very small town in Indiana, um, a very blue collar town. And so I'm a fighting Hoosier. So I always root for the underdog, always. And, and I think that's part of my passion in this, but also being from a small town in a blue collar environment, I found myself in healthcare, working with executives for many years and then becoming an executive myself, working with physician leaders um, who may not have been trained in leadership throughout their, their training. Um, and, and I just really have a passion for helping women and leaders that may feel like an underdog inside um, help uh, grow themselves so that they can stop feeling like an imposter and, and get that confidence uh, to do the good work that we all know that they can do. I love that. And that's something that I want to talk with you a little bit about today when you coach me, okay. um, that sense of um, feeling like an imposter and how do, how do I get over that myself as I'm helping women contend with that. Um, so like you, I've spent, um, a fair amount of time in healthcare and, um, most recently, um, as a director of HR and I feel like I learned so much about, um, systems that maybe on, on the surface seem like they are family friendly and that they really want to support women, but the structure of the institution and the norms within it can actually work against um, lifting women. And so that's, that's something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I grew up in Southern California. You'll hear that in my voice. I say like and totally way too much. I'm still working on that at the age of 46. <laughs> I live in Portland, Oregon now. Um, and um, I think the other thing that is important to share about both of us is that we are moms. Yes. We are moms. We do a lot of momming all the time. In fact, we're both hoping that our children don't come and interrupt us. Um, and if they do, who knows, maybe we'll invite them to join in. Um, so today, Gwen, I'm hoping that you can coach me around uh, some closure that I need to, to get uh, mm -hmm. because I ended a, a chapter, an eight-year chapter last week, and I'm still working to get a little bit of just, closure is the right word, I think, but also just think about who am I now that I don't have that, um, that identity that I'm shedding. Okay. Before we start, um, do you want to talk a little bit about how coaching is different or the same as mentoring or just good old leadership development? Sure. Great. So coaching, especially at the way that we're doing it right now, which is with individuals, really um, invests in the outcome of the individual versus often right leadership development is how can you um, how can you make a group of people um, feel connected and inspired to do their work? Coaching is really about individuals and um, individuals unlocking their personal passion, their inspired future, and then helping them figure out how to get from where they are to that inspired future. 
Um, mentoring is a little bit different in that I think mentoring tends to be um, a person who is getting wisdom from somebody who has a lot of experience. Whereas as coaches, we don't necessarily have experience in the realm that the person um, we're coaching is, is working. I think the other thing that's important to note about coaching is that it is not counseling. So we are not counselors. We um, have some working knowledge of um, psychological theories that may come into play in um, people managing through their identity, but we are, we refer people to counseling. And often what I find is that people who are having coaching with me are also in counseling. Um, and those can go, they can actually work, work pretty well together. Great, thank you. And I, I will just add that the analogy I use um, in my coaching practice and just for my own thought process is that I'm a mirror. Um, and I'm a mirror to my coachees because many coachees, frankly, don't take the time to look themselves in the mirror, look themselves in the eye, or even take five minutes during the day to really understand what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. And I, as that coach, in listening to my coachee, viewing the coachee, maybe can see some blind spots or maybe can recognize some gaps in what the person says they want to do and what they're actually doing and bringing that forward in a non-judgmental way um, just so that person can see that reflection and then know they have the wisdom inside them to know what to do with it or to do anything with it at all. Um, it, it's really the, the coachee and the coach that are partners in this process. And it's a very, very safe environment. It's super confidential. Um, what says, what's said in the room stays in the room. Um, and sometimes we're the, the safest place for that person, unfortunately, um, but they may not have a partner or a family member or a friend that they can express um, their feelings to or their emotions to, or even, describe a situation to. Um, so sometimes this becomes a, a very protected container. Yeah, I think it, you're making me think about that concept of, of vulnerability, right? And that, that especially in the workplace, right? We don't experience permission and we often don't give ourselves permission to express any kind of vulnerability. And so I think that's the other thing that um, coaching has definitely given me and, and actually meeting you, Gwen, in this, um, this school that we've been in together, this program, um, has actually unlocked some vulnerability for me that has been really helpful, both as just a human and as a coach. Thank you. And, and likewise, and I think you and I have both talked before especially for women, it's not professionally or culturally looked upon uh, positively mm -hmm. for women to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet there's so much potential and positive for a woman to be vulnerable with herself and with her team at work uh, to build camaraderie. Um, that's a really tough balance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're noticing it, but I think there might be a herd of elephants that are um, running through my upstairs right now. Oh no! <laughs> or it's <laughs> all my kids. Children? Yeah, don't the, hear and them. the dogs. You don't no. hear them? No, okay. no. You okay. must have some soundproofing. Sure, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but who's not dealing with that right now, Liz? Oh my gosh. Yes, everyone. I, I'm everybody. I, in fact, my seven-year-old army crawled <laughs> on her belly into my office last week while I was in a client session. Yeah. And I was like trying to <laughs> kick her out while not breaking my connection with my client. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, you, it was a you know what show. Yeah. I've got an open stairway from the garage right over here. So sometimes I have little birdies perched on the stairway going, bah, bah. 
I love y'all, but mm-hmm. I don't love you all right now. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, all right. Deep breath. Deep breath. <sighs> so what would you like to focus on today? So I want to talk through just the ending of this relationship that happened really suddenly because of the pandemic. And my new phrase is just because COVID, you know, that's my answer to anything because COVID. Um, But I finished working at a company last week um, that I'd been at for eight years. It was a very powerful working experience um, on many levels, both in terms of professional growth and creating relationships. Um, But also, I think, in terms of meeting the absurdity of professional life and realizing that I can screw up, I can be the worst version of of who I want to be as a professional, and I can figure out how to survive that. And so, so that's what I want to talk to you about today is like, how, what am I taking with me? And how do I process the fact that that's not going to be part of my identity anymore, being part of an organization? Okay, so you've used three really powerful or strong words. One was powerful, powerful organization, powerful experience. Mm -hmm. The second was relationships. You use that term relationships. In fact, when you started, you said, I walked away from a relationship of eight Mm -hmm. years. And then third is, you know, just the screw ups and um, being able to continue to uh, necessarily, not necessarily do everything perfectly, but learn from them. So are you wanting to dig into the relationships, the power? What, what power did you have in your former life that you're saddened you might be losing um, for the screw ups? Yeah. Well, I think they're all going to kind of come up, but let's talk first about the, um, the power. So the, it was a powerful experience in that It was my first time being considered an executive. It was my first time being on a board. Um, And I was surrounded by all of these people who had these, um, you know, they have a lot of degrees. They had positional power as owners and uh, owners of the company Um, and a lot of relational power because many of the people that work there, it's the only place they've worked, both in the the group of physicians, um, and then also the the staff. Many people had been there for 20 years. So it was a very powerful experience for me to become the head of a function and to help this organization that had recently merged with two other practices figure out how to grow. So, um, So I think that I'm struggling with how hard I worked to get to a place of feeling like, yes, I am respected. I'm adding value. You know, I know how to do this work to, oh my gosh, it's gone. I'm, I'm not there anymore. And I, and it, I said, I I walked away from it because it suddenly in the pandemic, um, I wasn't able to both be a homeschooling mother (laughs) a principal and a person that helps with crisis and and that we were in a crisis are still right. But it was really fraught at the beginning. And so I kind of just like dropped the reins and I haven't talked to many of the people that were so important to me. And I feel a lot of grief about that. Drop the reins. Grief back to relationships. Yeah. And as you said, still power. Yes. Yes. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of power for us as individuals 
feeling, and I'll say as women, feeling like we are serving, right? Like, who am I if I'm not taking care of somebody's problems? Mm -hmm. And there was a lot, I felt a lot of, of value in being that for people. Um, so you felt like a valuable problem solver? Mm -hmm. Yep. I felt like the corporate MacGyver mm -hmm. that whatever the issue was, you know, if there's, if there's a problem, people, it's the bigger the problem was, the faster that I felt like they would dial my number and they would know that I would just, I would rush, I would drop whatever I was doing and I would run toward whatever fire was happening. Mm -hmm. And I think too, I feel a lot of guilt because when the biggest fire of all took place, I, I feel like I ran in the opposite direction. Yeah. But I ran toward my family. Okay. And I don't regret it. Okay. But I still feel guilt about it. So where is the guilt coming from then? Um, know that I just, that I let people down, that, that I, that I couldn't hack it. Did you actually let people down? Well, I haven't talked to many of them, so I don't know what their sense. I, you know, I, maybe that's a story I'm telling myself, Gwen. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. And I think I think I've chose to be on my own side. Okay. And that's, that's the side I want to be on. <laughs> right. Okay. Even though I feel, you know, it, it feels awkward. It feels uncomfortable. It feels like, yeah, maybe that's disappointing for the people who are still over there tending the fire that I, picked myself and I picked my family. And I think too, uh, that's one of the ironies for me about being in, in a healthcare system, which is predominantly employing women, is that we expect, like the, the system expects women to pick the system over their family in the form of, you know, showing up when, whether daycare's closed or school's closed or our kids are sick. And it's just not realistic. And so there's part of me too that still feels this like frustration of, of like, your expectations are not realistic. So as you spoke about making a choice and moving toward your family, you smiled, you were light, you laughed. That was the first time in this session that you've been up here. Yeah. Yeah. So you made a choice. Now the story, what I heard your story was, and yet there's guilt because you dropped and ran in panic and you left behind in a fire. Mm -hmm. Is that really the story? Mm -hmm. Is there a different story to create? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, the other possible story is that it was time. I knew that I was going to be leaving there anyway because I had decided to start my own coaching okay. business and that it would it would have been a matter of time anyway that I was going to that I was going to leave. And so maybe the story is the pandemic hastened an outcome that was already a foregone conclusion <laughs> And it just didn't happen the way that I would have liked, right? I didn't get to control it. Instead of, you know, the being able to settle all of those relationships and have conversations about, you know, can we stay connected beyond this, mm -hmm. the corporate relationship we have. Mm 
why don't you take a few minutes with pen and paper and start drafting and playing with the new story. And the new story has to be something about I will, or I did, or my story is. My story is My story is that I joined an organization in a new role that I, that I had never filled before. And I I was authentic. I was I pushed I pushed people to question why they do things the way they do them. I did speak truth to power. Um, I did, I created a lot of programs that especially allow for people to be vulnerable, to show up as themselves. Um, I made a lot of mistakes, but overall, I think I left, I left the place and the people better than I found it. Okay. And what else? And I, I found a, a passion there for introducing that concept of vulnerability into leadership and wanting to continuously inject that concept of being real and that that is okay and being imperfect is okay. And I want to take that forward in my work with women um, and, and women changing systems that are not currently set up to give us platforms to innovate, to change the balance of valuing, showing up for our communities and our families at the same, at the same rate that we value contributing to a company's bottom line. Okay. So can you see this new story connecting to your future vision and your purpose? <sighs> yes, I can. In what ways? I, how I see it connecting is that, especially the end, it was messy. Okay. It was messy the whole way. You know, I mean, I did some dumb stuff, Gwen. Okay. While I was there. Don't we all? Yes. Yes, we do. We do. You want to um, talk about it? What dumb stuff? Okay, well, I'll just tell you one quick story okay. that kind of connected on my last day. So about four and a half years ago, I was in a meeting with a person that I didn't know very well. And we were kind of joking around and I accidentally said a word that wasn't the word I meant to say. <laughs> and that word that I said, I'm not going to tell you the word right now. Okay. I'll tell you later. Okay. It was a very bad word. Oh. Yeah. And it was a, um, it had Can a you in HR. <laughs> what? And you were in HR. I was the head of HR. <laughs> and as the word was coming out of my mouth, I was like, oh, get back in my mouth. Oh my God. And I apologized immediately. I was like, oh my gosh, that was not what I meant to say. Oh, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. And the person I said it to, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know him very well. And he just said, let's move on. Mm. <laughs> and so I tried to move on to talk about the thing we were there to talk about. 
and I kept coming back to it because I just like, you know, how you have that like physiological response. Like I was all hivy and I started sweating and I apologized like 50% of the way through the meeting. And he goes, I've moved on. Mm -hmm. And so finally we leave the meeting and I'm horrified, just horrified at myself. And I decide that I immediately, I have to go and resign to my boss, oh. who is the sweetest, like kindest man, de devout Catholic man. And I, I tell him I need to meet with you right away. And I like written in my resignation and I tell him what happened. And Gwen, he didn't even know the word that I had said. He didn't understand it. And I had to define it for him. Oh my gosh. I can't wait to know what the word is. Oh my gosh. So horrible. <laughs> anyway, he did not fire me. He did not accept my resignation. And I lived. I survived. But this person... I spent the next four years running into him every single time I went in the break room. Literally, we would go and I tried staggering my lunch time so that I would be able to avoid him. It was a him. And I swear I ran into him constantly. And every time, and it was a constant reminder, like, don't take yourself that seriously because you can do some really dumb stuff. Like, do not do not buy the hype that you know we can all buy into the more power people get the more we kind of think like oh yeah my you know what doesn't smell mm -hmm. but it we all are vulnerable we are all capable of mistakes absolutely so last week i went to drop off my laptop and of course it's a ghost town because covid and i cleaned up my cube and i just honestly there wasn't even anything i really wanted i think i took like a a drawing my daughter did and some pencils. <laughs> that was it. And as I'm leaving the building, who is walking in? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Him. He is walking into the building. It's just the two of us. We walk past each other and he goes, hey, we're both wearing masks. And he's like, I'm over it. <laughs> and I thought to myself I just started laughing I got in my car and I was like that was the universe saying I see you girl uh -huh. I see you uh -huh. this yeah. chapter is done yeah so is all that an analogy for your eight years there your high V mm -hmm. self mm -hmm. you yeah. know it sounds like it didn't feel very good <laughs> Oh, it was so awkward and it was so uncomfortable and it was so such a mess. And yet I lived through it. I survived it, you know, and that's what we do. And at, at our best to me, that's what we do. And that's what I want to take forward is not that people should accidentally sexually harass the <laughs> IT person, but that, <laughs> that we are, we're fallible. Right. And that's, that's part of being human. Yes. And, the, and I do think that the best leadership that we can demonstrate is authentic and recognizing our humanity and the humor and absurdity that come with life and work and family. Okay. So that's a really strong part of your new story. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. We can still have fun. Um, we certainly shouldn't make inappropriate mistakes. Um, we'll, we'll live with the consequences, but, but let's lighten up a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. again, I, I'm seeing you comparing and contrasting the eight years and your experience there, whether it was in your head or your heart, rough, you know, rough stuff uncomfortable. Yeah. Lots of houses. And then I compared, as I see you talk about your new story, you're light, you're engaged, you're, you're laughing. So how can we crystallize that new story for you? 
Hmm. And what does it mean? What emotions are you going to feel? How are you going to feel it in your body, this new story to become that new vision? Well, I, I, I think about discomfort, right? And that, that when life is really actually meaty and meaningful and propulsive, it's typically uncomfortable. Yeah. And so that is, that's the story that I'm taking with me is that it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to admit that you're uncomfortable, yeah. that you don't have all the answers. And that's what I want for myself and for the women that I work with is to acknowledge our fallibility and Brene Brown talks about this so well. I love her. Mm -hmm. She's my mentor that doesn't know she's my mentor. She's all our mentors. <laughs> <laughs> she talks about the difference between guilt and shame, right? And that, that like when I accidentally said that word, that I felt guilty, right? Because that wasn't good. It was not appropriate. But I ultimately decided that that doesn't mean that I am unworthy of, you know, contributing and being a leader. And I left in a pandemic, right? I dropped the reins because I needed to pick up different reins. I right. needed to be a principal. I needed to learn how to be a professional coach with a methodology and tools. I needed to be there for women, right? That's, that's who I'm coaching now. And it's so it's rich and it's messy and right. I love it. Right. And so is there a way to come up with a statement um, that when you do feel guilt, you will begin to reflect on what um, to keep you focused on your, your future state story or your new story or your real story, however you want to frame that? Um, yes, I actually have it on my wall behind oh, me because all right. I have all these statements that, that are meant to keep me out of the place of shame and keep me moving forward regardless of, um, what setbacks or what, you know, rejection I might experience. And so the, the one that I think most fits right this minute is that I can base my success on who I am, not what I have done. Mm -hmm. And I think that also resonates as we try to increase the number of voices in, in corporate leadership, um, the voices of women and um, people of color and LGBTQ, I think this idea of being able to contribute because of our ideas as opposed to our resume that shows that we have inhabited these roles that are typically inhabited by people of privilege. Okay. So now you broadened your story to serving more than women, people of color, LBGTQ. So I'm hearing a broader scope. Is that accurate? Or... I guess what I would say is I am a white woman mm -hmm. and that is what I know. So I think I need to be careful in trying to, in serving other groups in a way that might 
be inauthentic. So I just need to watch that. I think I want to, I want to pay attention to that. I want to learn. Um, I just, I don't want to make my story other people's stories. You know what I'm, you know what I mean by that? But I believe that we need to have more voices than are currently represented in positions of power in corporations. Right. Okay. Yes, I understand. We we can't be pretentious. Um, and yet we can't be pretentious with anyone, even though I'm also a white female. I've not lived your life. I've not lived in your family. I've not been in your profession or career. And so I, I think as long as we are the mirror and we really listen and pull out what's going on for that person, um, that we can be helpful. And I know a concern is not to be harmful or offensive in any way, unknowingly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Completely get that. So speaking of stories and not knowing each other's stories, mm -hmm. It really made me feel um, recognized today. Oh, in, in what way? In, um, just, I could feel you honoring my experience and really creating space for me to find the story that is me being on my own side and acknowledging um, the gifts that I'm taking from that experience, that chapter that just closed. I'm glad because you are wonderful and we all have lived experiences that we're not proud of or that were really tough or just sucked. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yet I've learned if I look at those as gifts and teaching moments, they keep coming back until I learn them. So I might as well try to learn from them. <laughs> they just keep coming back around. And, and it makes us so much stronger and so much better. Yeah, that's so true. I see that so in you. you. You're welcome. Thank you. Is there any more you would like to dive into today or any follow-up? that you think you'll reflect on? Mm. I just, I'm taking this story, the new story, okay. and I'm, I'm going to take it forward. And I'm looking forward to more conversations with you. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to instigating women to get in some good trouble. Well, not the kind of trouble I talked to you about earlier. No, no. Some Good respect, trouble. Some respectable trouble that will will have people notice in a good yes. way. Right? Yes. yes. Right? <laughs> so Liz, then for our listeners, any tips, tricks, exercises you want to highlight? Um, I think the one thing that I would say that really helped me in, in that story I told you about is the, um, the concept of guilt versus shame. Okay. And, and, you know, guilt being, I feel, I feel bad about, I regret that thing I did versus shame, which is I did that thing and now I suck and I'm not lovable and I have nothing to contribute and I should be, you know, cast out. And so I think that that is a tool that um, people can use to really pay attention to, you know, what am I saying to myself about what just happened? Um, and that's a, that's a tool for, for coaching, right? That, um, that we can use with, with ourselves, with our clients, and that um, I think especially women can help one another kind of unpack that and untangle that so that... Um, we don't go to the place of shame because while it is so human, we all feel shame. It doesn't help us move forward. I agree. 
And I would just like to add that I'm just reflecting over the last several weeks, um, the good old USA made it women's right to vote in 1920, which was only 100 years ago. Yes. Only 100 years ago. So I truly don't care what anyone's political persuasion. I just know that at least Liz and I absolutely believe in women's voice and lifting that voice. And so I can't think of a better way uh, to have our voices heard except to vote in whichever way, federally, locally, um, and, and from any perspective. Um, always use that voice because there are so many that came before us that worked so hard to get us uh, this right, um, and we do have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Amen. All right. All right. We'll see you next time. Sounds great. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate your vulnerability. Back at you. You're awesome.